We're glad to know you're still there. This is The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Today, uh, we're, our first topic is uh, the fact that INEC is raising concerns ahead of Bielsa Imo Kogi elections. Remember that they are going to be off elections or off season elections in November this year. So they're raising concerns ahead of these elections, holding in Bielsa Imo and Kogi different um, geopolitical zones, as it is. Uh, we're glad to be joined this morning by the Executive Director, Center for Public Accountability, in the person of Mr. Olufemi Lawson. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Okay, uh, what are these concerns? Let's begin with that, that INEC is raising. Because now, every time we hear concerns, uh, federal government is raising concerns that there are coup plotters uh, trying to uh, topple it. Before the election in February, they were raising concerns that people were they're trying to disrupt the election. Concerns, concerns, concerns that we've never caught any culprit raising concerns. What are these concerns by INEC? Well, these are legitimate concerns, especially when you look at you know, our political process and what happens mostly when elections like this get closer. And of course, from the report we have been getting from the media, you realize that there are real reasons to be concerned if you are a keen follower of the events from Kogi to Imo and Bayelsa. There have been issues of you know, crisis between opposing political parties. There have been attacks on supporters of political parties. You know, the other time in Kogi State, there were accusation and counter accusation by the two major political parties contesting the election owing to one attack on party secretariat, you know, convoy of candidates and the like. So these are legitimate concerns. And just like you said, we'll keep raising these concerns because as a society, we are not doing enough yet to criminalize mm -hmm. electoral violence. Mm -hmm. It keeps reoccurring because when this election comes, politicians, you know, out of desperation will sponsor violence then get whatever result they get from the outcome of the election, then we'll wait for the next four years before we start raising this. But if, as a society, we have made it a criminal offense for anyone, it's just like somebody picking up a gun this morning, going to face a bank, wanting to rob. He knows the consequences, even if it will be successful or not. But in the case of electoral violence, it looks so much like we are helpless, people come, after every cycle of election, they repeat it because nobody is being dealt with, just like you said. This, the society is not dealing with perpetrators of electoral violence and their sponsors. And that is why this kind of concerns keep emanating, just like INEC is raising the other stakeholders, the civil society, the media are also raising issues because if you look at developments that are unfolding, you come to agree that there have to be enough you know, concerns to be raised. And this time around, we are hoping that it will not just be another four years of lamentation, but that this would be an opportunity for the government to listen to what INEC is saying, to listen to what stakeholders are saying, to listen to what communities are saying ahead of these elections, so that we don't just you know, turn election into war in Nigeria. But are, are you, do you really, are you confident that it's because it's not being criminalized or because people who should, should uh, prosecute these people just don't do anything? Because if you raise a gun against someone, it's a criminal offense. If you, if you fight someone, if you kill someone, there are laws for these things. Yes. If you even incite the public, like what was happening in Lagos before the elections, yes. where people were coming out openly to say, if you vote this, I'll deal with you. Threat to life of, and property. It's a, crim, a criminal offense. And these people are not prosecuted. Are you saying it's because there are no laws or there, there's no political will to do this? To do this? Uh, yes, you're very correct. There's no political will. And in most circumstances, you know, issues of election are peculiar. There have been people who have been arrested for being involved in violence during elections, even in the last general elections. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that when such persons are made to go through the conventional judicial process, mm -hmm. you realize that a lot of them will end up being on trial until the next election cycle. Then, because they are on bail, in most circumstances, they get involved again in such, you know, conduct. But if we have a special you know, tribunal, just like we have advocated for the trial of cases of corruption and the like, that deals you know, with issues around elections. You understand? I think be, it would be easier and quicker to deal with perpetrators of violence than waiting on the normal courts, like we are, you know, like we are currently experiencing. But 
I think the most important thing to be done is not to wait on government, particularly our security agencies. Mm -hmm. We must begin to take our destiny to our hands now as citizens by first and foremost avoiding any situation that will lead to crisis during the election, by first and foremost also demanding action. But a lot of times when we don't demand action, you know, deliberately, there's tendency from, yeah, for, for, from government and security agencies. Because sometimes security agencies try to pretend as if they are not aware of some of these things that are happening. Let me use bias as a classical case in, 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 uh, in this time around. Historically, whenever an election is coming in bias, there has always been tendency for politicians from one side or the other to intimidate voters. Because you know, these are very unique people when it comes to election because of the pattern they have always voted. Let me give you two instances. In 2015, we were biased to monitor the governorship election. And the state was practically turned into war because of the desperation of a particular candidate to win that election. In actual fact, in a to sustain election in southern Niger local government, the largest, you know, where constraints in the state, because the local government was practically air stage. In a could, if our security operatives, election of observers, election officials were all air stage because somebody wants to be governor by, at all costs. In 2019, we also observed the election in the same state, and there were less tension, possibly because of the quality of candidates who were major candidates in that election. But this time around, that same candidate from 2015, whose tendency revealed that there would naturally be crisis when it comes, is in the race. And that is why, as I speak with you, that same event that we witnessed in 2015 is beginning to emerge. If you follow a report from Bayesa State of invasion of communities, People have been chased out of their communities all ahead of this election. We've watched visuals, we've watched interviews by citizens you know, in those parts of the state who are now being intimidated. A lot of people, families have been separated. There have been people who have been killed. And it is because we don't speak out enough to impress it on government, just like we are doing now. Particularly the security agencies that you cannot just sit back and make statements. When issues like this happen, you must name perpetrators. You must begin to shame perpetrators. And you must begin to make arrests and prosecute. Not just arresting or calling people for interrogation, just like you alluded to. So those are the steps that have to be taken now, which a lot of media and civil society organizations are already... Because this has been predicted. If you look at what Inek is saying, it is not what Inek just woke, woke up to say yesterday. There have been developments that have, you know, necessitated that statement. There have been other research groups like Cell Orb and the likes that have engaged, um, engaged the people by answer, that are interacting with the people, and the people have expressed their fear on the likelihood of violence based on the conduct of these desperate politicians. So we must now, as we move ahead, begin to let people know that no election is more important than the life of our citizens. No election is more important. And this is a call on the Bayesa State government. There is a government in Bayesa State. And I believe the government will not sit down and allow its citizens, you know, to be displaced, to be killed or, you know, injured because of the desperation of politicians. The state must also decisively deal with whoever. The state has the power to prosecute. The state has the power to, you know, order arrest. Whoever is found to be involved, irrespective of who you are, involved in issues of violence in that state, the government must no longer wait on Abuja or the Inspector General of Police before the, the safety of its citizens could be guaranteed. What if the violence is in favor of the, the state? No, that, that because, is... for instance, if you go to Imo State, yeah. uh, the governor, when he sat there, a lot of people were grumbling. He <laughs> came from, like, the fourth position or so and became governor. He, people didn't really like it for a very long time, and there was so much violence. And some people have said it is because of him that a lot of the things that are happening in Imo are happening. We go to Kogi State, for instance, we have the Tatata -ta -ta syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we see people dying every day. So uh, it's not a Bielsa thing. It's, it's, it's a Nigerian it's thing. It's a Nigerian thing. Yes. But these three states are particularly very yes. volatile. Now, when you're talking to the government, and you know that sometimes the government's hands may be soiled as well, what are you saying to the people? Because this is a matter of advocacy. This is a matter of enlightenment. What are the steps, the strategic steps that you're taking to enlighten the people so much that they will come to understand that human life 
is more important than any election or any government. Just like I've consistently said, the ultimate power is in the hand of the people. And in this case, even if supporters of the incumbent government are involved, I believe the government must have the will to deal with whoever gets himself involved in any form of violence. Why I am particular about calling out governments, particularly in those states, to act ahead of whatever the federal government will do. It's like, for instance, in Bayelsa, you see the last three and a half years or thereabout. If you follow the history of the state, you understand that that has been one of the most peaceful, peaceful era in the history of that state because of possibly the leadership currently. So if the government has been able to ensure peace for three years, does that, does that mean that crimes were not perpetrated? Does that mean that there were no tendencies for violence? The government must have been doing something to curtail excesses of those who have tendencies to perpetrate violence. So the government must use the same approach in dealing with whoever, irrespective of what political party. If, as a governor, you are popular enough and there's somebody within your party trying to truncate you know, your opportunity because of violence, I know such state should be sincere enough to prosecute such. And if it's also whoever coming from whatever camp or political party, it may not necessarily have to be from in the larger political party. Such persons must be made to know that this is a principle of our state. This state has stole the path of peace you know, and tranquility, and we will not allow you to come and destroy the peace of the state. And just like you said, the bigger responsibility is in the hand of the people. Mm. The people must be fed in demanding from their government what, what is this, you know, utmost responsibility of the state, their security and welfare. So we cannot sit back and expect government to wake up without, sometimes without call, to come and you know, address issues that affect us as citizens. I know that if the citizen in unison come and continually condemn this culture of violence that is being reenacted and across these states where elections are coming, I know that the government will be forced because these are the same electorate you are going back to to seek their vote. But intimidation has been going on for so long. You know, sometimes some people are outspoken and you wake up one day, you don't see them again. Nothing about them is known, no news. Is, what other avenues can we explore? Because people are afraid. For instance, the last, the last election came and some people went to court and said, we are not satisfied with what happened. Mm -hmm. And even lawyers were found like, fined like 20 million, like so much money, and they were warned strictly never to bring what they termed frivolous. Someone comes to court and says, I'm not happy about this thing. And all you say is it's frivolous, and you, you slam a fine on the person. So things like this are intimidating enough for the people to say, okay, let me just sit back. And maybe some people may not even want to go out and vote. The people that really have the interest of the, the state at heart. No, sitting back. So what, what, are, what other avenues can be explored, apart from just maybe coming to television and talk? Every avenue that will be explored must be legitimate. Yeah. And... Most usually, the court is always a resort for us as citizens. And I don't want to believe, and I don't want to agree with the opinion that the court will intimidate any citizen. Courts reserve the right to give judgment on, it, on, this, on the positive side or the negative side, depending on where you belong. But the truth is that we cannot... They have the right or we, they we, have the power. The power, the power, yeah. the power. So we cannot advocate any other option outside the legally available options. Mm. What we are doing is legitimate using the media. As we speak, there are communities across the states that we are engaging traditional rulers. Mm. There are communities that we are engaging faith-based organizations. We, there are some people that when they tell them so, so, so in church, they tend to listen more than even what they hear on the TV. Yeah. So we are engaging in that. So we we'll use every legitimate avenue to educate the people and to mobilize the people. But we will not encourage any form of action that is illegal, that promotes violence, mm. that can create more tension you know, in the process. So what the media is doing is fantastic. We've seen a lot of you know, advocacy from the media. We are seeing a lot from the civil society, from even the, some of the security agencies and government. But I think we must, as citizens, put more pressure to the extent that we explore every legitimate option, including going to court irrespective of what the outcome will be. Mm. Okay. There's only so much one can do. 
if the National Orientation Agency, for instance, is no longer functional, yes. because we don't hear much from them. And these are the people who gave us the Andrews advert of yes. those days, who gave us the Good Nigeria, Good People mm. adver advert of not so long ago and all that. But it doesn't seem as if the National Orientation is working. How do we get to change the psyche of the people of Nigeria to think positively, to think national, to think about the welfare of Patriotism is no longer there. I don't know if they teach them in school anymore. <laughs> because <laughs> because I, 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 rem I remember when we, we used to gather around the flag to sing the national anthem, and it was a thing of pride. I don't know if they still do it in schools, because every school has their own anthem nowadays. So I don't know how patriotism can creep back into our society. What else are you doing to change the psyche of the people, not just for election, but for patriotism, for instance? Thank you. Fundamentally, you know, we've lost a lot as far as our past is concerned, as Nigerians mm. and as a people, but we cannot just lose hope. Especially when you look at those institutions of government that have failed, just like you mentioned, NOA. But I think technology and you know, our advancement as a society has also provided other you know, viable options mm. to engage citizens, to educate them. In the days of NOA, MAMSA, there were no social media. The number of television stations in the whole of the country was limited, probably to NTA and a few other states you know, running Just television NTA. stations. <laughs> so, but now we have you know, avalanche of TV, radio stations, you know, social media, where we can engage citizens. So the job has gone more from the hand of government to the hand of the citizens including media organizations, civil society groups, who are now doing the job of educating the citizens. Mm. We are doing that, and I think with continued engagements like this, you know, and interactions with community organizations, faith-based organizations, you know, religious groups, as the case may be, we will get Nigerians you know, getting themselves, getting to know where they are coming from, and of course, redirecting to the part of patriotism, mm. which is very important very, to move this country very important. forward. Yeah. So what, have, what have the challenges been like? You know, most of the, when you go out to do this kind of things, what do you experience? Things that other people who might want to also engage in this might learn from. What are the challenges? Basically, it could be challenging, especially when you are involved in advocacies that have to do with elections because politicians have tendency to justify whatever they do. Mm. So for us, we have more role to play engaging the citizens than engaging the political class. Because for every A, you tell the citizens, politicians have the tendency to come and tell them it's B, C, D, mm. you know, promises, and of course, just to get the vote. And the moment these votes are gotten, it is the next four years again that you find them on the billboard, that you know they exist. So we are beginning to let Nigerians know that it is not just about elections. It must be continuous. After voting someone, you must be interested in how that person governs the society, how that person spends your money. And so it's a continuous process, and we, are, we don't wait for elections any longer. We want to consistently provide data that will encourage the citizens to follow up on their you know, leaders, to, that will also encourage government to also know the needs of the people. So we are doing all that, you know, a lot of data mining and analysis to know the real problem of our people, to know the real challenges facing our people, and to provide solutions by advising government and also at the same time advising the citizens. Mm. Okay. So you see a, a new Nigeria, if possible, right? Very, very, I'm very optimistic. You are? Yes. I you are. are? I'm very optimistic. <laughs> okay. It's good to see someone who is optimistic. Yes. Please pass that optimism <laughs> to the Nigerian people. Just Surely. talk to the people uh, as a closing. Well, I, I want to encourage Nigerians to continue to demand for transparency and accountability. Nigerians belong to Nigerians. Nigeria belongs to Nigerians and not to, not to government. So whoever is in government today will be there temporarily. As a governor president, your maximum is eight years. As a legislator, you can decide to go and sit there for us, but one day. But as a Nigerian, you will never cease being a Nigerian. Mm -hmm. And that is why you must continue to see the country as yours and continue to demand for good governance. And most importantly, ahead of these elections, the people must avoid politicians that are preaching violence, that are known for violence in, in taking decisions you know, when election come in November. Mm, okay. Nigeria is ours. Even if you decide to jackpa <laughs> to anywhere, Nigeria remains the only country that you'll be given the 100% regard as a citizen. When you go to America, even if you become sure. a citizen, there it's is Nigerian always... Nigerian American. Yes, in, you're a Nigerian American <laughs> and all that. Anyway, it's, all, it's, it's been a pleasure having you, Mr. Olufemi Lawson. Uh, thank you so much for coming My on pleasure. the program.
In case you're just joining us, Mr. Olufemi Lawson is the Executive Director Center for Public Accountability. And he was talking with us about the elections coming up in Imo, Kogi, and Bayelsa, and the need for us to take the bull by the horns as citizens and make sure the concerns expressed by INEC and whatever authority uh, is nipped in the bud and we don't have violence. We'll take a short break and when we return, we'll still be talking INEC, but in another direction. Stay with us.